Right. So um, I think people would join still, but I think we make a, a, a start. So it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Daniel Blackburn. And Dan is a consultant neurologist at Sheffield. And he's also a senior lecturer there at the university, um, doing great work in particular technology wise. Um, doing lots of really interesting approaches. So I thought it might be interesting to several people here on the, um, in the region to hear what they're working on, in particular the Cognospeak um, tool, which they, they're trying to develop some automated assessment of cognition based on language. Um, as always, please keep your questions to afterwards, or we have a Q&A questions, a Q and a session. And um, I hand over to you now, Dan. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Michael. And um, yeah, delighted to speak to you today about um, Cognospeak. Um, so it is an automated assessment of cognition based on language. So I'll briefly go through the current memory assessment pathways, a little bit of language and Alzheimer's disease, and I'll just finish with a tiny bit about some work we're doing on a remote assessment of driver behavior. So obviously for the patient, it's hard for them to know when they've got a memory problem. And then when they do have a memory problem, maybe themselves or their care or care partner will, will go to the GP first who are very busy and they don't really have the time or the, the tools to make a, a good assessment often. And then there's months of, of wait to be seen in the secondary care clinic. And that's the current problem. And we'll just define that a bit more. So this is what the six CIT is that the GP does. Um, it's relatively short. It's... Um, it has some reasonable sensitivity and specificity, but what you find in clinical practice is that we see people who uh, don't have a dementia, so you know, who have anxiety or depression, who will fail this test and get referred to us when they could be referred elsewhere. And we see people who uh, have, are doing well, who've got a good cognitive reserve, um, highly educated or done a good job for a while, and they won't fail this test for quite some time. So the GPs could be falsely reassured by just following the, the cutoffs on these tests. So the problem with the memory care pathways is, is not a new issue. So back in um, 2013, uh, the G8 ministers, when David Cameron was the prime minister, had this declaration to say that they want to defeat dementia um, by 2025 or getting there to have some disease modifying treatment. And that may or may not come to fruition. But they also made this point that the stark reality is that globally dementia is grossly underdiagnosed. And in the UK, they looked at what's called the dementia gap, whereby percentage of people who've got a, a diagnosis of dementia by their primary care coding as opposed to the proportion that you would estimate should have dementia in that um, area and they estimated that 50 percent of people in the UK didn't receive a diagnosis um, in lifetime and therefore there's this big push for primary care to refer more people to secondary care and particularly I think importantly to refer people at the earlier stages when the, potentially there's more that can be done for um, patients and you could see this was um, between 2009, 2014, a, you know, a huge increase in people seeing secondary care. And um, with this came no extra funds from the government. So this meant that really secondary care memory clinics spent a lot of time doing assessments for dementia, um, but that post-diagnostic support became harder to, to get or achieve. Um, COVID did not help, but, but I think it's important to say that it, the, the problem has existed before then. But during COVID, many services either closed or redeployed uh, had staff uh, moved around and that's had a, that has had an effect on memory pathways and so the current uh, period of time like up to 2019 the overall weight is mean of um, 2021 17.7 weeks but that is there's a huge variability in that from zero weeks to 104 weeks and we had a look at our waiting these recently and ours is between 58 and 68 weeks um, in the neurology led memory service and about 35 weeks for the old age psychiatry led service. I think it's important to say that after COVID lots of people used phone and video call and you can see that persists so they're saying up to 11% of people are assessed by video, 24 by uh, telephone call and 45% of people have been assessed in their own homes and that that has advantages and disadvantages in terms of efficiencies and accuracy of your um, data you get. I think there's also this large variability in the diagnostic terms that people produce. So this is looking at the people diagnosed with MCI and dementia. And you can see on the right of your screen, there's one clinic where 100% of people are diagnosed with dementia, which seems 
pretty unusual that that would be the case. On the far left, uh, 75% of people are more, don't receive a, either a diagnosis of dementia or MCI. And the ut- and the use the, the percentage of people receiving a diagnosis of MCI varies a lot across the country. So I think it's important to state what CognoSpeak is designed to do. So, that, so I think it's our aim is mainly to help manage demand, to sort of improve the current system of primary care, referring into secondary care and secondary care managing people. Whilst there's this big initiative of brain health clinics that we think CognoSpeak can be part of, but that's really detecting dementia at the earliest time point. That's a, that is a slightly different time, um, different problem. And there are lots of different sort of ways you could assess cognition. So uh, there's online neuropsychological testing, which uh, I think there's a great need for because access to um, neuropsychologists delivering uh, face-to-face neuropsychology assessment, which takes several hours, is um, it's not feasible or scalable. EEG, we've done some work on EEG, on brain network connectivity, and I think that certainly has utility. It measures the brain with really great temporal resolution, so like up to 2,000 data points per second from multiple areas of the brain. And we, we, we show data that just looking at the trans um, biparietal synchronization in, between, in the eyes open and eyes closed state, and we can distinguish people between Alzheimer's and healthy controls. There's, there's a lot of different techniques that can be used, and, and there's no um, definite consensus on what is the right EEG technique to use. Uh, Michael has um, done the Sequest Hero, which is a really interesting tool about this navigation skill. And I think looking at navigation ability, making that operationalized, is also going to be really useful. There's also speech, which is a sort of uh, bi-directional um, assessment that hearing increases your risk of dementia. We need to assess hearing to make sure our cognitive assessment is normalized, but there, there are ways that we can perhaps combine them, I think. And eye tracking has also been looked at. But language has been known to be affected now some of these for a long time, although it wasn't at the forefront of many people's sort of investigation. So Iris Murdoch, the, the famous British novelist, um, wrote her books without much input from an editor. And when people analyzed her written text showed clear loss of complexity of language in her later books. And Ronald Reagan, when they analyzed how he answered questions to interviewers when he went for his second term in 84, they showed clear changes in speech patterns uh, that predated his diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease by about 10 years. And it makes you wonder why the, uh, the American political system is having two old men going up against each other in the future presidential elections. So um, the language of people with Alzheimer's disease, and we know when we see people with dementia, they often appear empty, but, but they, they retain those social skills. So if you have a very superficial conversation of what the weather's like or how are you, um, you can see that they, they come across very well. But if you probe them for the details of what's happened, re- particularly probing that episodic memory, what have they done recently, what's been in the news recently, then, you, then they struggle to do that. And, and as they um, progress in the disease, that becomes more and more apparent. Um, so this is the sort of Cognospeak development timeline. I'll come back to this slide, but we've been working on this project for, since about 20, 2015. Um, and we've done a lot of work with people with dementia, so the photo in the top right shows people with Alzheimer's disease, their carers, memory clinic nurses. We've had old age psychiatrists, GPs, um, and our computer scientists all in the room together to try and work out how, how can we sort of develop a tool that's useful for everybody. And our initial work um, was of audio and video recording of people in memory clinic. Um, and can you hear this? Who look, you live together. Yeah. Who looks after the money in the house? Christina. Has she always done that? Was that changed? Sorry? Has she always looked after the money or has that changed? Okay. So you can see this long pauses of, of somebody with Alzheimer's disease, you know, positive head turn, um, and asking them a functional assessment about um, finances is a, is a really important question to ask people. And I'll come, play a couple more clips. Can you tell me what problems you've been having with your memory and when you first noticed them? But first of all, just. Uh, in, in Exactly when. Okay. Mm, I would say it's approximately like two years. Yeah. Can you give me an example of the last time your memory let you let you down? 
um, I was on the telephone making an appointment with someone at work and we sent appointment cards out to him and I picked the appointment card up and I said to the customer, right, I will send you a... Uh, and I couldn't think of the word appointment card. Okay. So we can see people with Alzheimer's disease, when you ask them to give these examples based about their memory letting them down, it's like all the time, every day, but they can't give you specific examples. While well, somebody with a functional memory disorder or functional cognitive disorder describes this clearly very well-remembered episode where they, they perceive a memory failure and perceive this is really bad to them because we all have memory first, we all forget someone's name, but our response to it, is, it differs. So in this um, study, we recruited people when they were sent to the uh, memory clinic and the nurse spoke to them outside and we screened quite a lot of people. A lot of people weren't eligible because there were lots of diet and um, did not attend. Many people didn't have dementia were coming there. There's a percentage of people who weren't speaking English as the first language. And we, we recruited over 112 people in the end. And I think what's apparent is, is that people with a functional con disorder are happy to speak about their memory complaints, are happy to be audio and video recorded, so they were much easier to recruit. Whilst recruiting people with neurodegenerative dementia at that initial time point is, is a tricky thing to do because people are concerned, they're worried, and any sort of research is, is perceived as a barrier or difficulty. Um, so I think it's also important when we publish our results that of our neurodegenerative, these are young people, age, mean age 63, and their mean adamant was 58.2 or a mini mental of 18.79 versus the functional con disorder patients who had a mean Addenbrooks of 93 and a mini mental of 28.7. They're pretty matched on mood and anxiety, PHU and GAD7, and we did a, a detailed neuropsychology battery on them. Um, and we create, we gave these audio and video files to linguists who were able to create a, a sort of scoring system, some of which is, is known before, such as has the person been accompanied or not, if they've come with someone, they're more likely to have dementia. Who's more concerned about their memory again if it's um, themselves, it's less likely to be a dementia. And then particularly these giving examples of how their memories let them down and, and responding to compound questions, we can see differences between functional cognitive disorder and people with dementia. And we published this and showed that we could see clear differences on this. And we um, gave it to a blinded linguist for a further 10 participants, one linguist who had been in the study the whole time and a new linguist who we trained up on it and the new linguist got one incorrect. Um, so, so it is, it, it, it has some utility, but it, it, it can't be scaled up. We can't audio and video record people. So how can we automate it? So one of the first things we did was just use those transcripts um, and fed it into a computer to use machine learning. And, and, and the computer was able to distinguish those transcripts between people with um, a neurodegenerative dementia versus functional con disorder. And interesting, the sort of number one rank feature was the number of unique words produced by the, the clinician, the neurologist, because we were responding in real time and changing how we spoke to people as we responded to how they responded to us. You know, the dementia, we simplified our language. Um, I think I'll just describe a little about functional con disorder. I think it's really important that we involve people in clinic because what we what the, 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 the test we need is can it distinguish people who are attending memory clinic? It's not distinguishing people with Alzheimer's or marker impairment from people who are self-declared as healthy. So I think it's really important to have this population, but I think defining them is a bit difficult. We use the criteria by Smicker et al, which is a, a German group, as sort of six months um, progressive memory disorder. They scored within one and a half standard deviations on, not on cognitive normative data. They could have a score highly on anxiety, but if they scored um, in the moderate range of depression, they couldn't be included in this disorder because of that difficulty of distinguishing depressive pseudo dementia. And I've contributed some of these articles, um, this idea that life events, interpersonal conflict, increasing your stress, and you'll think my memory's letting me, letting me down. And then as soon as you notice your memory's not letting you down, particularly if you've always had a good memory, you can perceive that really badly and think, oh, it's something terribly wrong with me. It causes more distress, more worry, um, and, 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 and it, this vicious cycle comes about. I think it's important to say that like many functional neurological disorders, sometimes people with functional disorders, it starts with a, a, a organic, whichever term you want to use, a real problem. So I think some people with functional con disorder will be the early stages of the neurogenesis mention will develop that, um, but it, and it can be hard to distinguish them. 
and I don't and I think it's quite hard to create um, criteria for them and particularly with the advent of um, biomarkers when you come to publish about these disorders they, they want you to say oh do they really are they biomarker negative nowadays um, we showed this data this is from 2013 that up to a, a fifth of patients coming to our clinic had a functional common disorder and about a fifth has mood and anxiety and Cambridge which is in red had they'd been collecting data and they had similar data to us and we did a survey of other neurology led memory cells and they showed this picture and I think this is um, the up-to-date audit of memory clinics which is showing up to 47 percent of people seen in the under 65 memory clinic don't have a diagnosis of dementia and that's that's a large number and if we if we could uh, diagnose them earlier we could potentially keep them out of memory services which would free up quite a bit of time and we are seeing more people with MCI as are uh, the old age psychiatry led memory services. So we think the solution or part of the solution in this sort of dementia ecosystem will be uh, Cognispeak or a tool based on language. So uh, Cognispeak is a virtual clinician that you can access on a tablet, uh, currently an iPad or computer. And it asks similar questions that we ask in memory service uh, and a few uh, neuropsychology questions, so uh, a cookie theft description, uh, fluency task, and it can be completed in about sort of 15 to 20 minutes. So this is what it used to look like. Hello, I am the Avatar Consultant, and I'll be asking you questions today. This avatar is designed to reproduce what happens in the memory clinic. Thank you for agreeing to take part. I will start to ask you questions shortly. Um, and using this system, which is a very, very simple sort of Google avatar, we recruited, we recruited about 300 people um, and we published data on this group of MCI, Alzheimer's disease, healthy controls and functional cognitive disorder. All I had neuropsychology and, and um, neuroimaging. Um, and we could detect accurately, this is a sort of confusing matrix. So those people with Alzheimer's disease and MCI, we detected it putting the fully autonomous system in 86.7% accuracy or sensitivity. Um, and we actually predicted those with healthy controls and function con disorder about in 76%, which is, which is pretty similar to sort of pen and paper tests. And, and obviously one of the main advantages, this requires no clinician time. If you try to look at a four-way classification, then clearly it, it becomes a much harder task. It's better at picking up Alzheimer's disease it misclassifies healthy controls as functional con disorder and, and vice versa, which is sort of semantic thing because cognitively they are the same, really. And MCI had a 60% accuracy rate, which is really where we need to improve the system. So going back to this, we had done all this work with stakeholder engagement. And um, in 2020, we put an application in for uh, an NIHR i for i grant, which we, which we got and started approximately 12 months ago. And I think the things we're aware of is that most of our healthy controls were from the University of Third Asia. They were white, well-educated, um, and this is going to be an issue going forward, making this really useful uh, in clinical practice. So uh, the prevalence of dementia is going to increase more rapidly in uh, populations where there's um, the, the population is going to age more quickly. So the, the prevalence is going to increase um, by about 90% in Europe, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 290%. In South America, it's predicted to be 360%. Um, and clearly, in the UK, there are barriers for people from ethnic minority groups to access memory clinics. So their perceive, perceived uh, views of what cognitive impairment is, it's a normal part of aging, it's, it's not pathological, so they don't think they need to see somebody. Um, and there, may, there is stigma associated with dementia. So many cultures don't have a, a word for dementia. And, and importantly, the clinics aren't well set up. We don't have tools that are that are really that have been tested in uh, ethnic minority populations to really be accurate and accessible for people. And there's been reports showing that the percent, the prevalence of dementia of ethnic minorities in, in the UK will increase more rapidly than the white British population. The black uh, and South Asian community have greater numbers of vascular risk factors and are more likely to receive a diagnosis of vascular dementia. Um, and, and therefore, there's a big need to include uh, ethnic minority groups in research um, and, and, and making adjustments to our memory clinic pathway. So, and there is a, a large number of people who are moving to the UK all the time from outside the UK um, who we need a, a health service that can manage that. So, 
with our NHR call, we had um, Israq, a Somali community group. So Israel Youth is their financial operation manager, and he was uh, funded as part of the grant as a co-applicant. And Sarah and Musa are research champions who we've trained up to be able to uh, know what dementia is, to publicize what the research is to the Somali population, and to undertake cognitive assessments. So this is me, Sarah and Musa, and Lisa, who is from Devices for Dignity, who's helping us run this, and April was the research champion at the time. So we did a little bit of work on the mocha with this population, and the mocha is translated into lots of different um, languages. And we did, a, we did a, just a couple of weeks work in Kenya once using it, and it's interesting when you look at this, the Swahili version, they use the word train or treni, and there's only one train in Kenya that goes from um, Nairobi to Mozambique. And they were like, you know, why wouldn't they use bus rather than train? So th there are problems with direct translations and the direct translation of the, the, the sentence repetition, which in English is, I only know that John is the one to help today and the cat always hid under the couch when dogs in the room is a complex sentence that when we um, undertook this with the Somali population, many people didn't repeat the sentence as we wanted them to and, and could score them on the mocker. So there are a couple of other tools. One's called the RUDAS, the Roland Universally, Universal Dementia Assessment Scale, which was validated in Australia. Um, it has a verbal fluency uh, task. The, the praxis test is sort of pointing at, at, at body parts. The, uh, the word you remember is, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna, I want you to remember tea, cooking oil, eggs, and soap. And you get them to go through that, you describe that, you're gonna go shopping with them, trying to orientate them, trying to make it as easy as possible for them to remember the words and making it useful for them. And then there's a multicultural uh, cognitive examination created by Runa Nielsen in Copenhagen, which um, again, for the, the remembering um, words, you give them this picture. So they choose the words themselves. So they choose turtle or tortoise. It doesn't matter as long as they use that word again if you use trust can or bin or bucket, as long as they can repeat it, it, it is fine. Um, and we just looked at the mocker, the RUDAS and the MCE, and it, it was about 40% of the healthy controls from the Somali population score below cutoff on the mocker. And we had a, a, a student working with me and the research champions who just compared the score. So every person who came in, of 20 people, we have got all data here, we compared how well they scored. And, and the research champions were able to deliver the RUDAS, the MC and the MOCA the same way that a student from the University of Sheffield could. So it showed that, that we could train up the research champions. Um, there was some anxiety around the performance. People felt concerned you know, that they were being tested and you had to build a rapport with the population. Um, Education is quite hard to uh, quantify because many of these population left Somali during the civil war and then have, might have spent some of their education in France or Holland or Sweden and then come to the UK. So a very disrupted education. Um, some of the people would rather be tested by the university student, um, student because they felt that the research champion might tell other members because they've known them so well. So that confidentiality, although we made it very clear, it wouldn't be shared. There was concern there. Um, and we so we are working with primary care now, John Dixon in Sheffield has got this tool which maps all 84 GP practices and you can look at their measures of uh, deprivation and ethnic makeup to see whether we can target certain GP practices to recruit from. So this is the new version of Cognospeed. Hi, my name is Nadia. Welcome to Cognospeak. Cognospeak is a digital tool used to assess people with memory problems. So I'll move Hi. Oh. And this is how we envisage Cognospeak to work in the future that um, if you go to the GP in the future, they rather than doing a pen and paper test, you would use Cognospeak on a tablet or at home. We would receive the result, we'd go to the GP, would advise them who needs to be referred on. Um, and the secondary memory service would also receive the report so we could decide when to pre-book tests, who needs to be seen at an earlier point rather than later point. Um, and we, we think we can keep those people functional cognitive disorder out of clinic because we should be able to uh, diagnose them earlier, although we need a pathway for them. Um, and there's a potential a large saving if you, if you save clinician time. And I'll just end the show now to show you if I can. This is our website for it that, that people can now access. And if people are interested, they can um, click on and, and try the tool out themselves. And this is our current data report. So 
we're early days. We've been having the system that's open since January. We recruited 36 people. We can see our gender distribution of male and female. The recruitment from um, the Somali population is, is going well. So we've recruited 15 people. Uh, they're predominantly, they're all healthy controls from the Somali population. We need to increase our recruitment of MCI and we are recruiting people with a functional cognitive disorder. And we can look at, um, let me see this one. We can get a bit of feedback about whether people like the system. There's a sort of simple thumbs up, thumbs down to how well they liked it. And we can have a look at which uh, avatar they chose. So they've got a choice of four clinicians. So uh, two men, two women with different ethnic minority status. And we can look to see which one they like to see if there's more utility to that. Within the ISRAC population, we can look to see whether they're doing it at ISRAC at the community center or they're managing to do it at home to look, to get a bit more data on how feasible it is to do this in your own home and whether you can do it on your own. We've been, um, we're doing the MOCA, the RUDAS, and we've also using Cognitron and online neuropsychology, and we can look at all those results going forward. So if I minimize this and maximize this. At the same time as using the main pathway, we're aware that stroke increases your risk of dementia by ninefold. Um, so we've tried to use Cognispeak uh, in the stroke pathway. We started recruitment in 2020, so in COVID, so it was really difficult because the nurses, the research nurses weren't allowed on the ward. So we're phoning people up after they'd been diagnosed with a stroke, and that's not a very efficient way of recruiting people. And as opposed to memory clinic patients who are medically stable and are often keen to take part in research, the stroke population have had a huge shock to the system and often uh, just don't want to don't want to come back to hospital, don't want to be seen again. So we screened um, over a thousand people to recruit a hundred people and of those a hundred, uh, approximately a third didn't complete the baseline assessment and then we are following them up at six and twelve months um, but there's a, there's a large dropout. So we've got about 20 people at six months and about seven people at 12 months. So we're looking to see whether we can sort of shorten the Cognispeak system. We've shown that the fluency, semantic and particularly phonemic fluency correlates with the MOCA score. Um, and we're trying to see whether there are certain questions within Cognispeak that are more useful at, at predicting MOCA. Um, and, and obviously the cutoff of MOCA is different in the stroke population. And I think the important thing is not the absolute score you score, but actually can you use the same system repetitively and it can be stored within a memory, not memory, a healthcare software system. So therefore you can see how they've changed over time rather than the mock that gets lost uh, or it's not stored properly. So just the final little bit of talking about assessing driver, uh, it, assessing drivers um, remotely. We got a digital health catalyst award funded by the ESRC. And we look to recruit 15 people with MCI and 15 healthy older adults. And this comes about that medical conditions impact on our ability to drive as we get older. And driving is this key sort of uh, important thing for our level of independence. Um, and the DVLA um, states that if, you've had, if you have dementia, you have to report it. If you have MCI, it's much less vague. If you don't think that it's in, in, impacting your uh, driving, you don't have to declare this to the DVLA. Um, and if you do declare to DVLA, they can renew for a year, they can revoke your license or refer for an on the road driving assessment. And all of them require a medical report, someone like me asking somebody what their driving is like and normally asking their care partners, which is a very subjective uh, assessment. Uh, and there's risk with this in that drivers might be forced to stop driving too early. A lack of objective measures can make it feel unfair to people. And they can feel defensive and their family can feel like they're policing them. They're the ones who are deciding for them when it's safe to continue driving, when it's not safe. And that causes a conflict that we should be trying to avoid. Um, and others might continue to drive when they're not safe. So we think there's a, there should be a, a fair way to assess driving based on real life driving behavior. So um, there's, there's, there's lots of data about risk in driving. Um, and although older adults don't have uh if you don't have more accidents than younger people um and when you do driving simulators often people older drivers uh, they have slower reaction time but they they drive differently but it's quite that if you look at the number of accidents per mile driven people aged over 70 do have more accidents so they're driving less but
but the, but the amount of time they're on the road, they're at increased risk of having accidents. And if we could pick out those at greater risk, then potentially some of that might be modifiable, but sometimes it might not be, and we could be more objective in how we do it. So we've been fitting this uh, small device in people's cars, uh, doing uh, neuropsychology testing, looking at self-reports of driving ability um, and monitoring driving people. What we found is it's very hard to recruit to because people feel very concerned about having their driving monitored, feeling like you're going to pass the data on to uh, the insurer, which we won't. Um, we share anonymized data with the company working with the flow. Um, but it's it, it's just been very difficult to recruit large numbers. So we've got about 20 people who have been recording for over 12 months now. So we've got thousands and thousands of miles of data, but we don't have a large number of people taking part. Um, and we are looking at speeds and new driving distraction, all these different things, looking at the time of the day, people are driving, seeing, looking for um, hours of sunlight to see whether we can see changes in people's driving behavior and how that is, is related to their cognitive performance. Uh, so we think this could benefit from doctors who could objectively um, have objective information on people's driving behavior. Older drivers may be able to use this device to sort of see whether they are driving safely, how do they compare to safe drivers. Uh, families have some help in making a, a decision about when to know when to stop driving. And insurance companies will know who or how to insure. And there may be changes in the future about uh, driving license as you get older in terms of um, having graded or uh, driving license where you can't drive at night or you can't drive on motorways. Um, and But we don't have any evidence for whether that's going to be useful at all at the moment. So this data collection um, and future studies like this may be useful. So we, we've worked with the Flow, who's the, our, the company we work with. Um, we're working with Devices for Dignity again. And we've had stakeholder engagement with older drivers, the DVLA, Department of Transport, lots of people to try and understand how this best fits in. Um, I think with this advent of new treatments, um, such as lecanemab and denenumab, um, they're really, it's, it's exciting time to be a clinician working dementia. I think both protein-based biomarkers and new treatments, I think it's just going to increase the demand on our service. So, we, so there's an urgent need to get this to work quite, to work properly manage that service more effectively and we need technology to do that i think if, if more people were tested for amyloid which I, I don't propose but i think some people may get that testing if they think there's a treatment for it then we they might not develop alzheimer's dementia for 10 or 15 years so there's going to be again another demand for a way of tracking cognitive function and i think cognitive speaker's got real utility because it can be done at home done remotely along with other tools that have been developed so our future work is we need to recruit more people with MCI. So we're recruiting in several clinics in Yorkshire, but also Manchester and in London. We've opened on joint dementia research and great minds. We're developing our AI algorithms to get improved accuracy, different stacking techniques with the machine learning programs. We're gonna uh, sort of document our work with this, right? That's been quite useful. Uh, and we've got a small grant to sort of show what impact it's been to that community as well as to the University of Sheffield. And we're going to start working with a South Asian community later this year. There's a lot of work on regulatory approval that I think, I'm not saying we underestimated, but I think it's, 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 a, it's a difficult field. Uh, Brexit has made it probably a bit more complicated. Um, and, and sort of the regulation needs a lot of work in sort of ensuring you've got all your codes correctly documented and how you um, change it. The commercialization plan, you know, we're working with key opinion leaders to get you know, get this into clinics to see how people find it. And I think we need to validate it against other biomarkers. So we're doing some of that of neuroimaging and we're looking to do some of it with protein-based biomarkers. And I think there's further, a lot of work needs to be done to develop it for stroke survivors and potentially other uh, populations. So it's a, it's a big team, myself and uh, Heidi Christensen lead it. It's a Heidi Christensen's professor of computer science. We've got um, neuropsychology, two GPs, um, a psychiatrist. We've got a big EDI team, um, sort of Adi, Adi Bajo is sort of uh, an equality, diversity, and inclusivity lead for the NHR. Uh, we've got um, ISRAC within the team, and we've got a York Health Economic Consortium and commercial managers and Therapy Box are our commercial partner who created this really lovely tool. We, we're really pleased and it's much easier to use so that now people can access it they can download the patient information sheet. They can consent themselves. 
um, and we can state how frequently they could be followed up. So it could be every six months or every 12 months rather than requiring a researcher to contact them. And I think particularly for the healthy controls, we're not looking to do any sort of touch with them at all. They will, they will join via joint dementia research or other areas and be able to access the tool um, whilst we try and recruit the MCI um, population from memory clinics and try and get more phenotyped data on this population and more longitudinal data on them. So um, I think that's all I wanted to say, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Dan. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, and you can see. Yeah. Let me. So if you have any questions, feel free uh, to raise your hand and either come online or type it into the chat and then I can um, read them. Brilliant, thank you. So I guess maybe I kick us off in terms of some of the biomarkers. Have you looked at anything in terms of biomarkers yet, how it relates to biomarkers level in terms of proper speak? The only thing we've done is um, structural MRI. Mm. We're looking at uh, medial temporal lobe volumes um, and we have we have that on we've got about 50 mci 25 you've regressed 25 you haven't with structural biomarkers and are analyzing that at the moment but we don't have the data yet we have a very very small number so probably 10 people who've got csf biomarkers um and we're exploring that i think for this being a scalable tool looking to do blood-based biomarkers mm -hmm. on them um and i think we, we're just we're just getting ahead around about the disclosure of blood-based biomarker results to people and and get some more funding to do that. Of course, yeah. And did you look at dementia subtypes, if that makes a difference? I'm not meaning maybe the progressive aphasias or the non-fluids because that's too easy, I guess. But I mean, even just looking at vascular versus, you know, or vascular, yeah, how, it's particularly I'm thinking of vascular changes, of course, very often slowing down people how does this impact? Have you looked at that? We haven't looked at that in, in any detail yet. We've been collecting in our stroke population of about 50 people. They've got mild strokes. They sort of NIHS score of around four. Um, and, and I think what we need to do is get more of those pure vascular cognitive impairment patients, such as the Cadacil ones, who we can mm -hmm. see that subcortical slowing. We've got about 10 people with Parkinson's disease who are not cognitively impaired as well, who recruited the system. But it's not quite large enough for us to look at, to sort of look at those differences at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Great. So we have two uh, comments or questions. Uh, one is from Ramaswamy. Please clarify how the GP saves time with Cognizant Speak. Is the GP able to leave a patient to operate Cognizant Speak by himself or herself? And how is it scored on the tablet? Is the patient expected to click anything? If if so, can the family help them? Yeah, that's a good question. So we envisage this being as the GP wouldn't, at the moment we know our work shows that GPs often see people three or four times, you know, to retake the history, exclude other causes, do a pen and paper test, get a collateral history. Whilst we would want this to work, that the, the person can do this entirely on their own. So all the recruitment currently now is done in a person's home, unless they can't do it and we sort of fund for them to come into hospital. So they should do it on their own they it's much more intuitive now so the, the virtual assistant talks you through the process when you start to give you a couple of test questions so you can sort of those test questions are tell me a bit about yourself tell me your favorite meal so you get used to answering a virtual condition and then the assessment starts at the end of it you you have to click next for each question to move forward but the buttons change color to make that easier to to show and after they finish the sort of uh, verbal answers, we collect the PHU-9 and GAD-7 from everybody. So we've got a mood uh, and anxiety screen, which is collected. And then there's a brief feedback session. The uh, care partners can help them in terms of pushing uh, buttons along for them, but they shouldn't be helping to answer questions for them. Um, and we're trying to collect that data to see how many people need help to sort of use the system. It is relatively easy to use, but I think as we see populations in their 80s and 90s, not everybody's gonna be able to use this tool, but um, you know, that's part of what we're gonna find out of how many people can't use it. 
How did people then, I mean, in terms of the avatar, do they find it strange with the avatar or do they get quickly used to it? I guess you must have investigated that. Yeah, yeah, we do. People get, people have got a bit nervous saying, oh, last thing I want to do is speak to somebody and they find it strange and then they immediately, really quickly get used to it. And so uh, I've had some patients who said, oh, they, they just weren't keen at all doing it. And then afterwards said, oh, it's fine. And, mm -hmm. and I think what we found was useful is that we, we created a short video of people using Cognispeak. So in our patient information leaflet, mm -hmm. they can access that video and see what it looks like and see, oh, it, 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 yeah, it's fine. It's just a funny person talking to them. Yeah. We, the original one, we gave people the choice of like a Google bot, computerized speech, or it was my recorded speech. And obviously nobody wanted to have a computerized voice. But I think as those computerized voices get better, mm -hmm. we may be able to uh, use those. But within the current system, we've got, real videos of people that we bought from another company that they've got lots of creative risk and, and you can change what they say pretty quickly so we can add in new questions easily but obviously the ideal situation is that you could have a fully automated system that you could just change what it says much more quickly than that but we're, we're not quite there yet and maybe sorry i'm asking too many questions it just shows always that i'm interested <laughs> in terms of because people can have strong dialects, um, well, you know, myself included, I guess, but you know, it, so is it in terms of the language people use, doesn't matter as much as the hesitations and the pauses, would that be correct to say? I would say uh, that is pretty correct. So our, we have an acoustic model, which is probably, is, is probably the most important currently still. We do uh, have automated transcripts and we look at sort of uh, nouns, adverbs, pronouns, all these sorts of things coming into there. So that, as an import, our word error rate is not great because it's there's relatively noisy environment still people at home um but despite that we can we can we can show meaningful difference between people and i think as we get better we we hope to maintain that word error rate even with people with different accents and that's the sort of holy grail that we're trying to get to hence why working with the israc team the south asian community and then using joint dementia research to try and get recruitment from across the united kingdom to see whether everybody from Liverpool classified as demented or Newcastle, that, you know, to make sure. <laughs> well, I still have problems with the Scouse accent. I have to admit that. I really find it hard, but there we go. <laughs> That's just me, maybe. Sorry. Um, Soul asked, thanks, Dan. That was a great talk for your driving research. I'm wondering how you're looking at road risk and driving smoothness using the telematics device. Do you have any early findings? So our early findings is the, the 20 people. We, we can see some people driving differently. They They out differently it's it's less smoothness it's um it seems to be more around sort of approaching fast junctions seems to be different to the people the people with mci and so we've got we we've we've only started to analyze the data recently because it's taken such a long time to collect data so we don't have uh, anything that we can publish yet and we're just sort of uh, trying to our aim now is to try and keep this population going for longer so we, we apply for ethics to keep people with the boxes in for longer and so far, only one person has said they want to take the box, take the box out. One person had his car stolen, so he's lost it. And one person had got knocked out when it was valeted. So I'm going to have to meet any, he, he said he can't put it back himself. So I'm going to meet him. We think we'd like to expand recruitment virtually. So many people could fit it or with it, it's relatively easy to find to see whether we can recruit people more widely rather than just within Sheffield and Yorkshire region. Um, but yeah, that's where we are at the moment. Great. And Jacob Heath is saying you showed some results from a perceptron model in your slides. What kind of perceptron architecture did you use? And do you have any public code published anywhere? Yeah, so I'm not the, the best person to answer this question. So our code currently isn't published. Um, we've published in like uh, engineering journals uh, and described some of our data. And I think it's interesting as we go for the regulatory approval of, and working with Therapy Box, the company, about what you can and can't publish and trying to sort of maintain our IP at the moment. So I'm happy if you want to email me and I can put you in contact with our engineers to answer some of the questions that you've specifically got about that. So, yeah, I'm happy people to email me and I could either ask Heidi or Nathan from the team to, to get back to you on some of those answers. Great. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Any other questions we have or come on online? Um, oh yeah, sorry, Russell. Um, with the delays you have highlighted in all areas, how is this impacting on your research optimization?
obtain the most appropriate people to adequately access research. What would you suggest to circumvent the situation in terms of the new dementia drug highlight in the media today? Who, who, would, who feel it would only be appropriate for people diagnosed with early onset dementia? Not sure, early onset, you mean you mean very in the early stages of dementia, I think we should say that's what you mean, Russell, I hope. Yes, yeah. Um, yes, a good question. We, I think we've, we've, what we want to do in this study is, is to recruit from primary care because that's where it needs to happen. And it's really hard to recruit from primary care. So we've opened it in 10 GP sites um, but it's really clunky. So the GP refers to us. We, we were going to then say, oh, that's suitable and let them know. But the wait is so long, we didn't think it was fair. So we're now screening people who are booked into clinic. Then inform the 10 GPs who then text somebody. The person says, yeah, I'm happy to share consent. Then we recruit them. And I think that's we've recruited about three people via that system. I'd like my plan is I think to change strategy and recruit people from our waiting list directly myself, just to try and get people on the waiting list recruiting. And I've spoken to GPs that we know some of them will score highly on mood and anxiety, but the GPs will be happy to be to be sort of informed of that information. Um, I'm not going to answer your question. The most appropriate people to assess research. I think we don't have enough black, Asian, ethnic minority people coming to clinic at the moment, so we are. I think that's why we're working with the GPs to say, can we target certain GP practices? And in Sheffield, there's called the DPEN practices, which is a GP collaborative that work in areas of deprivation. And they've got um, PPI groups to really try and find people from South Asian population, from, from uh, Somali population who have cognitive impairment, because we need to do more than just recruit healthy um, Somali population. We need to recruit people with, from the Somali population who have got early stage um, Alzheimer's disease. And that's going to take a lot of work. And we know from data that there was a, a study on cancer, and I think they recruited 700 people, of which only one was, was non white. So there's, there's lots of examples of how this doesn't work very well. And we're, we're trying really hard and we're trying to publicize our. Um, our study to get as many people involved. But but I think really you need the trust of those communities. We've worked with the Somali community for about three years now. And it only comes and what they, they the community tell us is, you know, where's the money? Essentially, you know, you need to support us to support you. So like having Ismail funded throughout it, funding the research champions, and, and we've had the same stories in Bradford. So we've got a bit more money to, to pay for more research champions. But then once that happens, you've got to describe the study, you've got to train them up and then they need to publicize the study to get people to take part. So it's it's an ongoing uh, work. And I think we need, I need a bit more help with this. So we're also applying for the money to try and develop that side of it further. Great. And then Jenny had a comment further to Michael's question about dialect. I'm from Norfolk. I would say shoe instead of showed. I'm not sure if I pronounce this correctly, Jenny, but there we go. It is could be interpreted as shoe. Yes, it's really interesting, isn't it, dialects? Uh, I think they can be, be, well, I don't know, Yorkshire accents, of course, are famous for this, aren't they, Dan? I don't know how you deal with this. Maybe your system is trained on Yorkshire accents. I, <laughs> I think we are overly trained on Yorkshire at the moment. So we, I think that there are all these risks and people ask us that. And, that, and that's why I think the next, this year with the new system, we should be able to create large numbers of healthy controls with different mm -hmm. dialects. I think... The, the, the two things we, we need to collect is we've got we're, we're collecting people's postcodes but like I recruited someone from Lancaster last week and he was Scottish so it's really hard to get people to self-certify their accent it's difficult and also um, from the Somali population we were recruiting what was their first and second language but obviously that doesn't be, mean very much if their second language was English and and they're completely fluent in both whilst their second language is English and they can't so we, we're, we're going to collect some data on people's levels of fluency so we can try and look at this in a bit more detail in some ways you're quite like to say you know how how thick is your accent how strong is your accent to do that but you know that we can't collect all the data that we'd like no clearly and then sam has a question have you thought about british sign language version in the future and i wonder if it would show similar differences as with using uh with those using spoken language yeah we we haven't done that yet we with the current system when the when the uh, the virtual mission is speaking the words are on the screen so there are subtitles with it that last for the length of time the the, the clinician speaks and then go away so you can't re you, you can read it so 
it's there for, for people with hearing impairment. It should be easier to use. Um, but we haven't got a, a British Sign Language for um, the profoundly deaf um, people to to use. But I think it's a it's something we should look into in the future. Great, excellent. Well, you know, thank you very much. I think if there are no further questions, I think we've done enough grilling of Dan. But I think this was fascinating. Thank you so much, Dan, for giving an overview of really what you've been working on. I think fascinating and really really cool stuff. Um, so thank you again for taking the time. And um, just to say to everybody, our next meeting, I think, is on the 22nd of June. And um, yeah, if you want to get in touch, also if you want to get in touch with Dan, just email um, either me or um, maybe the other Dan, sorry, is sitting in the background, maybe you can put our email address so you can contact, we can forward the, the, the emails to, to Dan. Um, oh, Russell is asking when are meetings again planned to meet at UEA again? Well, this is a tricky one. We've been exploring this, but um, we might do hybrid meetings in the future. So um, yes, our email address again is down there. If you want to email us, have any questions for the speaker or about future events, then please get in touch. But just to say again, uh, thank you to Dan for um, coming, speaking to us today. And um, yeah, and um, hope to see you all soon, yeah? Thanks very much. I put the um, Cognispeak um, email uh, well, website in there, so you can have a look at it on there, and you'll be able to find me, my contact details, I think, at the bottom. All the um, people involved in the study are at the bottom, and you, you'll you be able to find me um, and email me directly. That's fine. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, Dan. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.